Hey, so this event happened to me around last summer. It was probably the scariest story in my life, and I wanted to share it so that hopefully someone can learn from it. Something I've realized growing up, year by year, is that this world can be an amazing place, but it's also filled with some super sick people. And unfortunately, I've seen that side of our world firsthand. I'm a very social person, and I always love the opportunity to hang out with friends whenever possible. I'm also the type of person who's always looking for the next big thing. I guess I should tell you I was an 18-year-old male at the time of this story, and I have a decent-sized friend group of both boys and girls. And throughout high school, we had done a lot of crazy shit together. And being just out of high school, we wanted to do something insane together again before departing for college. And at that point, we all decided we'd like to go camping in the middle of nowhere for three days. Fun, right? And for some miracle, all of our parents thought it would be fine. So we had six people going. Me and my girlfriend Stephanie, my friend Brandon and his girlfriend Kaylee, and Steve and his girlfriend Sarah. We had decided to have three different tents for each couple, for reasons you can probably guess. Being a former Boy Scout, I was aware of everything we needed to survive for the three days. Food, water, and other essential supplies. Being rebellious teenagers, we also stocked up on plenty of booze and weed for our fun getaway. So mid-July, we depart for our camping vacation. After hours of driving and driving down back roads, we eventually find a place that looks secluded, but not sketchy like some horror stories. There were houses nearby, but not too close. Again, we weren't looking for some sketchy woods to camp out in. But unfortunately, this area had no cell phone service. It took us at least an hour to get everything set up. While the girls and Steve finished setting up the camp, Brandon and I took a look around while fetching firewood. Eventually, we came across a cool-looking trail. We weren't too concerned because there was a house within a mile radius. We assumed that those people must use this trail to hunt. It was pretty big in this area. Or maybe animals used it. If you're wondering about our car, we drove a Honda Pilot, which was Steve's, that had plenty of room for us and our supplies. We parked the car rather close to the site, so we had eyes on it at all times. The first night, nothing much happened. We rolled a blunt, drank a bit, and called it a night. The next day, we decided to explore the woods a bit. Brandon and Kaylee stayed behind to watch the site and spend some quality time together. The rest of us decided to go down the path we had found earlier. Around 20 minutes down the path, Steve spotted a metal fence. We approached it to find a cemetery. The cemetery looked very old, but there were signs of activity there. Not some voodoo or cult-like stuff. Some flowers and notes left at the graves. Beyond the cemetery, we saw a bigger trail that had tire tracks and a half-assed parking lot for the area. We ventured down the path a bit more to spot some deer, then headed back because it was started to get late. That night we partied really hard because we had to leave the next day and didn't want to return with extra beer or weed. This night was the polar opposite of the other night. The other night was peaceful, and we had assumed this night would be the same as we all began to turn in. But boy, were we fucking wrong. You would assume there would have been warning signs early in our trip, like a rusty knife on the path, or foot tracks around our site. But it wasn't like that at all. All of a sudden, we woke up to a blood-curdling scream coming from Steve and Sarah's tent, as we heard the fabric being ripped by what we assumed was something sharp. I guess Steve hit the man really hard with his flashlight and was able to get both himself and Sarah to his car. Here's the issue. Steve's tent is closest to the car, while the other two tents were closer to the trail. To get to Steve's car, we had to get past whatever had attacked Steve and Sarah. Luckily, all our drunken selves were gone, because before getting into his car, he yelled cemetery, and it clicked in my head. The trail on the other side of the cemetery... I quickly grabbed Brendan, Kaylee, and Stephanie and started running towards that trail. I used my phone flashlight to help us see. You might think, why would you turn your flashlight on? 
Well, the last thing I wanted was to completely miss the cemetery and be lost in the woods with whatever attacked Steve. By the time we get to the trail, Steve and Sarah had gotten the fuck out from the site, and we could hear a man chasing us several yards behind. We were able to find the cemetery rather easily, and I hopped over the fence first. When we all got over the fence, we noticed that Steve had not arrived yet, so we all hid in the cemetery. Luckily, to our advantage, it was pitch black by the time I turned my flashlight off, and we all hid there in complete silence. My heart sank when I heard the metallic shaking, as if someone was climbing over the fence. The guy had tracked us down probably due to the fact that Steve had yelled out cemetery. We all stayed still, and we heard the ground crunch as the man took slow, deliberate steps. When in fight-or-flight moments, you're capable of a lot more than you would think, and your brain is put on some super high alert mode or some shit. As the man approached, I realized that I had my small Swiss Army pocket knife in my pocket. As the man's steps grew closer to me, when he was right about on top of me, I grabbed the knife, jumped out, and lodged it into the back of his knee. The man stumbled into the ground with a shriek of pain, and a metallic sound rang out as he dropped his weapon. Soon the pair of headlights came around the corner. Steve had finally made it. All four of us got up and ran towards the car. While I got up, the light gave me a glimpse of the guy. He was a tall, bulky man, and had a look of pure hatred in his eyes as he clutched the back of his knee. By his side was a huge machete that he had dropped. I was the last one to get into the car, and before I even fully closed the door, Steve floored it out of there. The girls were all bawling their eyes out. We drove until the first house, where we politely knocked and asked for directions to a motel. Thankfully, the people that answered were a very friendly and nice old couple. They told us there wasn't one around for miles, but they took us in and gave us warm food, and a place to rest for the remainder of the night. In the morning, the man brought his hunting rifle with us to retrieve our stuff from our campsite. When we finally got there, nothing was stolen, but all of our equipments and tents had been slashed up. The elderly woman called and made a report while we were gone. When we got back, the officers were at their home, and we each gave our statements. The officers said there wasn't enough evidence to find the guy, but they promised to try and do a thorough search. We headed home later that day. No one said a word the entire time. We were all trying to process what really happened. Unfortunately, the police never found the guy. Yeah, college split us up a bit, but we barely talk about it as a group, and it's been a whole year. My advice to all of you is to please find a populated place to camp. I don't care if it's some Yogi Bear camp, and be in reach of help and the police. Stay safe, guys. Please. This happened about six years ago. For a little info about myself, I'm a 23-year-old female, and I'm also very small. I'm only 4 foot 11, and I weigh 95 pounds soaking wet. No, I don't have an eating disorder either. My 11th grade year of high school is when this event took place. It was within the first two weeks of school, and I was a bus rider. We had this new bus driver. Me being a very social person, I always thanked him for his services and was always super nice to him. I believe that's where I messed up. One day after school, I was riding the bus. I was always one of the first to be dropped off, so when I realized I had been on the bus for an extra 10 minutes, I was a little curious. I chalked it up to the fact that bus routes normally get changed all the time. At this point, I had been on the bus for about 30 minutes, and there were two kids left, an old friend of mine and, of course, myself. This friend of mine lived in a very remote location, and there was absolutely no cell service out there, so when we dropped her off, I couldn't call my parents to let them know what was happening. My friend tried really hard to convince me to get off at her stop, Little did I know I should have listened. As we were leaving this area, the bus driver pulled into a cemetery. He told me to look out my window, and when I did, I saw a torn to shreds baby deer. My whole body went into shutdown mode. I didn't know how to react. My initial reaction was to pull out my phone and call my parents when I suddenly remembered that I had no signal. I got up and ran to the back of the bus and keep in mind I was the only kid now. 
We sat by the deer for a good ten minutes, the whole time I'm in the back, and my blood was absolutely boiling. It took everything in me not to run off that bus and look for help. But when we started to leave, the driver just started talking about random things. How he loves his wife, loves his new job as a bus driver. The whole time he was barely paying attention to the road. I got on my phone and went to Google Maps. Thank God they work even without service. I realized my house was 15 minutes from where we were, and I was super excited to be going home soon. Boy was I wrong. This jackass took a ton of back roads and kept talking to me. The whole time I'm sitting in silence, still with no service on my cell phone. About 20 minutes later, I started to see landmarks that were around my neighborhood. I looked down and there's service on my phone finally. I immediately called my dad, but he didn't answer. Not even two minutes later though, we pull into my neighborhood and he suddenly drops me off at my house. I wanted to run, but for some reason, I just stood in my yard and stared at him frozen in fear. Eventually, he slowly pulled off, and when he did, I took off running into my house. My parents were in the room, freaking out about where I was. My mom started grilling me about where I was and what I was doing. I get out of school at 2.15, and I didn't get home until around 4.45ish. On a normal day, I would get home at around 2.30 so my mom was very upset. My dad's phone was dead because he had tried so many times to call me. I began to cry and tell them everything that had happened. My dad was furious, called my school and used my mom's phone to record the whole conversation between my dad, the principal, and myself. Thankfully, the principal was just as extremely pissed off about what had taken place as my dad was. My mother was just cuddling me, asking me if I was okay and if the man had done anything else. I didn't go back to school for about two days. There was no formal investigation. The school handled it all themselves. The bus driver denied everything, but when they checked the camera footage, the camera happened to be covered by a sticker or something of the sort. Thankfully, because of this, nobody believed the bus driver at all, and he was immediately fired. I had never rode the bus since. I know this isn't as creepy as most stories, but it's still the most bone-chilling experience I've ever had.